You are listening to The Green Flame, the DGR broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the grassroots to the global. We are your hosts, Max Wilbert and Jennifer Mernan. Before we start the show, a quick note. Deep Green Resistance is in the middle of our spring fundraising drive. We're trying to get about two dozen more people signed up as monthly donors to our organization. These monthly donors are incredibly important because they provide us with a sustainable base of funding that we can depend upon going forward. And this reliable funding base allows us to plan ahead and be strategic about our decision making. Funding is incredibly important as well because it allows us to hold events and actions, to organize conferences and campaigns, and to fund organizers so that they can set aside bullshit capitalist jobs and use the time that would instead go to this labor to organize for ecological revolution. We need your help, so if you're interested in becoming a monthly donor, check out our website, deepgreenresistance.org, and click the donate button. You can sign up on that page. Thank you for listening, and thanks to everyone who has supported us thus far. Okay, for today's episode of The Green Flame, I'm here with Jeff Gibbs. Jeff Gibbs is a filmmaker. He's the writer and director of the new film Planet of the Humans, which was just released for free on YouTube on April 21st, the day before Earth Day. Jeff, thank you uh, for being here. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Max. I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, chance to have the conversation. That's why I made the movie. It was to have a uh... You know, not the answers, but the the right conversation. Yeah, so let's start out with that. You know, in your own words, can you give a summary of the message of the film and why you made it? Um, Well, if if I might give you a little movie philosophy about that, um, I I actually think a film that has a message usually sucks. And people sniffer goes off and they're like, oh, you know... um, and so I always, when I think about making films or talk to people about it, it's like you, your, your film should be about a question. And um, if the film, and like a narrative film, a, you know, a fiction film, um, you, you don't know how it's going to turn out and you don't know the twists and turns. And the very best fiction films leave you with something to talk about. Like, is this that, that, you know, how is, so... I'm not trying to evade your question. I, I'll get back to it, but it's it's like um, it really is a quest, and it, it you see at the beginning of the movie very briefly my initial quest to think, oh, if I made a film about how bad the state of the planet is, and just show people all these things, and my conceit at the time was, I know I'll just film things that are in our own backyards that'll wake people up, um, and then I realized, wait, that's not what's in the way. Some well, what's in the way? Why do people you know, sad about the polar bears, but I'm not really going to change my life, right, because of the polar bears. It's sad about the honeybees, but okay, uh, do you want to go to Starbucks or you want to go down to that other place to get the cappuccino? Um, you know, it's just everyone was carrying on like normal. So if, if there was a mission, it was to kind of shake us out of our stupor and um, help us understand, help me. At first, I had to discover that the story we're in that it's only about climate change. And climate change is, of course, you know, uh, disastrous and it's going to get worse. But we're in a way bigger mess than just climate change. And the idea that technology, even if it was green, is going to save us from climate change, I just began to realize that that story, you know, kind of climate change plus renewable energy equals we're saved, um, was in the way. So if, if there's a mission of the film, it's to help us understand the depth of the trouble we're in, uh, come out the other side where once we hit the grief or despair or the darkness, uh, we can actually look at this with fresh eyes and to help us understand the environmental story we've been for the last few decades um, is 
is it's not working and it's not the right story it's it's p- partially true um but it's not it's not going to do what it's intended and i guess what's weird is the deeper i went into this just like you see in the film um you know it's like a, okay the solar panels don't quite work as they are but you know well whatever maybe you know some something new will come along but the more i look and, and so many things that are not in the film like the desperate efforts to create you know, fusion energy that require these machines that are like billions and billions of dollars that haven't even produced a positive result that are so complex. You know, uh, the quest for nuclear is going to save us. You know, nuclear is a complex, you know, it's just, you begin to realize not only with renewable energy, but with these other energy sources that what are we trying to do? We're just trying to keep this machine going. So anyways, that's a long answer, but um, I really think the essential nature of our task right now is to ask the right questions. Um, and uh, that's what I hope people begin to do. Thank you for that. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you later, I was going to say, you know, people always seem to want this sort of Hollywood story from a film where it has a neat and tidy beginning, middle, end. It has a clear resolution. They want this self-contained package with no loose ends, right, that tells us about solutions. And your film didn't do that. Like, And so many films do, like An Inconvenient Truth or uh, Food, Inc. or all these you know, sort of environmentally themed films over the years. They take that simplistic, Hollywoodized approach. And I like that you didn't do that. You sort of assumed that your audience is intelligent enough and has a much, an, enough emotional complexity that they can analyze the information themselves, that when they're just presented with a set of facts about the world, they can analyze it themselves. And one of the things that's interesting about this is I think you get those people who have their preconceived notions that they're really stuck into, like the demagogues, you know, and and on both sides, you get the demagogues of green energy, and then you get the demagogues of fossil fuel worship, and and, and, but it seems to me like the average, those demagogues, they're they're going to see the film through their own lens, right? And that's why I think you're seeing this sort of v- very visceral attacks on your film, which is what I want to ask you about next. But it seems to me from reading the comments on the film and like most of the average viewers understood what you were doing. It seemed like people got to the heart of the issue, the the questioning and the open-ended problem that was presented by the film. So do you think that's the case? What do you think the average response has been like? And then let's transition and talk a little bit about, you know, the, the attacks and the haters and the people who are really coming after you. Yeah. The, um, you know, we just, we're, we're, uh, we're talking with a friend who, um, uh, from New York who had seen the film and loved it. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I said, well, what about the attacks? And it's like, what attacks? <laughs> it's like, you forget there's a big world out there, you know, and the, the noise level on the, um, in the usual environmental channels is, is high. And there's, um, but, um, you know, there's a whole world of um, grassroots activists and, and uh, people who care about the environment who are not following um, the minutia of the, uh, you know, the, the current you know, climate change slash renewables uh, movement. So, but I, I kind of developed the same thing even a couple of weeks into this, maybe days into this, is that, wow, the, you remember the, those inkblot tests back in the day? I don't know if you like the Rorschach right. tests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the movie's like an inkblot test in which all these people are projecting uh, all of their issues. And it's pricking much more deeply than I thought the um you know it's bursting bubbles and as you see in the center of the film the reason i put that in there about all humans tend to have religions and not just picking on those of us who have believed in green but we all have these religions that are our defense against the darkness the darkness that we've created in our own cultures uh, and the darkness of our times they protect it you know if we have a hard time coming to grips with our own death to face the potential death of our planet and our civilization is even that much harder so you develop this protective shield of belief in green you know if we do these green things it's all going to be okay um and 
so you strip that away and then that's where things come out and um and it's interesting not having the solution because even if we were able to run everything on solar and wind or somehow nuclear was not was harmless or um, the energy fairy dropped us off all little you know iron man things to put on our chest that would allow us to fly into it you know what we're doing collectively to the planet is it's still not sustainable uh, and so it's still not going to save us um, so early on early in my thinking way before I switched the focus of, of this film to our uh, fantasies about green energy I, I was like wow no one can stare into the sun no I, I I'm not advising staring into the sun but it's like people that believe in fossil fuels critique green energy right people that believe in green energy critique fossil fuels and we don't want to admit that there could be truth on both sides people that critique renewable energy and fossil fuels believe in nuclear it's like it's like that's when i realized no one can stare at the sun it's hard for anyone to accept there is no magic bullet or cure except um you know see i'm hesitant to use any word because everybody gets all tribal and whatever but you know whether it's degrowth um whether it's um you know we've just got to come up with a new concept for the fact that we can't keep having an industrial civilization that grows forever. We can't have capitalism driving the bus and we have to figure out a way to reduce our human presence in a way that takes care of everyone and allows nature, um, to heal and to flame back into this abundance and this, and this magic, uh, that's always been in existence. So, yeah, that's, that's, the psychology of this film is, uh, you know, I've been thinking about it since the very beginning. Um, and what would it be like to tell a story that got kind of through that, um, through this fog that we all want, wander around in where, yes, we're worried, but let's just go on with our lives. Yeah, one of my friends was summarizing the response by the green technology advocates to your film and she was saying a lot of it comes down to something like i want cake you know it comes down to this this idea you know she's making fun of it but it's a serious thing that so many people in the so-called environmental movement have become used to the modern standard of living the modern high energy way of life that many people literally literally cannot imagine giving that up or moving away from it deliberately like it's easier for people to imagine the end of the world and the end of everything than it is for them to imagine the end of industrial capitalism which is stunning it's stunning to me and i think that you know every social movement has to be founded every major social change or revolution is ultimately founded on imagination right it's ultimately founded on our mm -hmm. ability to yeah. think about and conceptualize a different future or a different way of living and when a movement gets to the point where its ability to conceptualize a future that is different from what we're in now when that ability is gone that is that is profound and that's something you know as you know I'm I co-wrote this book Bright Green Lies with Derek Jensen and Lear Keith which covers many of the same topics uh, as your film and that's one of the main things that we are really trying to get at when we break this all down and I, I, it seems like you were doing a similar thing you know that we have to be honest and we have to be adults uh, and look at the reality of these so-called green technologies that aren't helping the planet they may in some limited cases in some analysis be less harmful than the equivalent fossil fuel technology but that doesn't mean they're not harmful. It's just a different different type of harm, right? Different type of harm. Yeah, it, it's it's a trade-off. And one of the things I want to do in the follow-up is really just illuminate. Uh, you know, we just say mining like it's okay. It's just one thing. But if you, you know, um, you know, actually examine this, what mining is. What are, what are we talking about here? It really it uses 
uh, an amazing amount of fossil fuels and we're a long way if well i don't think we'll ever get to the point where these giant machines will be run on batteries i mean the size of battery you need to run a uh, semi tractor trailer with a full load is just i think you guys mentioned that in the book i've seen a draft um it's phenomenal but it's um, right it's like you, three quarters of the three quarters of the trailer basically uh, you know and but where does it stop? You know, I mean, even Van Jones, who appears in the movie briefly, um, you know, every single part of the movie has so much behind it that people are not aware of when they start attacking it. You know, Van Jones uh, was part of the Apollo Alliance, which was an effort to bring, uh, you know, labor and uh, business and uh, environmentalism together. Um, right. And they had, uh, when he looks cheap, he said, maybe I should know more about that, you know. They actually had a dot on a map for this trees to ethanol, forest to ethanol scheme that you see briefly in the film in northern Michigan as one, something they were proud of. And it was going to get trees from thousands of square miles. Um, they, they would have needed specialized in hardwoods. Um, before they removed the figures from their their site, you could see that they're going to use more in natural gas to process the trees and they were going to get out ethanol at the other end. It was just part of the reason for so many things in the film isn't because it's about biomass. It's just because... Have we lost our minds? How do we lose our way so right. much that somebody could proudly declare that? Uh, but even but every, everyone in the film has wisdom too. Van Jones said to me, um, which is not in the movie, he said, well, you know, we've got to be careful because we'll just have solar-powered bombers, solar-powered, you know, bulldozers. You know, I would add fishing trawlers, solar-powered. But, you know, we just have no off switch. And... You know, I, I, I don't know if you saw, but there's a couple stories in the news recently about uh, one demonstration of, of now they want to we want to mine the bottom of the ocean to get materials for technology and green energy. And it's just 100 yeah. percent wipeout of the ecosystems that we don't even understand. It's 100 percent wipeout. And then the dust blows off. And who knows how far that smothers things. Um, and not only are they experimenting with this, they actually have, I, I believe, around 10 nations are planning are in process of going ahead with that and it's just so we to me we've really lost our way and part of not having answers is i think the battle is for the story that we're in um and that's why you know when this culture destroyed native cultures the stories and the language had to be destroyed the religion had to be destroyed uh, not just the buffalo and the and the tall grass prairie that the, uh, uh, you know, indigenous people in the, in the, in the, the great Western and Midwestern areas lived off of, um, by the way, there's only, um, I think less than 1% of the tall grass prairie left. I mean, this is, so it's the battle is for a story and I, and I can't determine what the story is, but it's the story we're in is, is failing us and failing the planet. Um, more importantly in a way, um, Yeah, another angle on this that we talk about in the book is, you know, Naomi Klein, I don't think you talk about her in your book, but she's she could have been right there with Bill McKibben, right? She has attacked your film. She has been a major promoter of green energy, and she's this prominent figure in the, in the broad left, in the environmental movement, and so on. And her film, The Shock Doctrine, to me, or her book, The Shock Doctrine, ironically illustrates exactly how the very real and extremely serious existential threat of climate change has been used to shift the entire environmental movement into supporting industrial technology, right? The fear that has been created by climate change, the, the incredible amount of concern and worry and, you know, passion and, and all the emotions that people have about climate change, this existential threat has been used by corporations, by, you know, nonprofits that have seen a great way to get a very sustainable budget by a lot of people who, some of whom I think are, you know, deliberately, uh, deliberately making decisions that aren't in the best interest of the planet and aren't being honest about their intentions. But many of whom I think are just, are just deceived and are buying into this story that is false, right? Uh, well, I, did, I wasn't aware that she um, 
to add that in there. You know, it's, that's interesting because I feel like so many people have um, gotten part of the truth or glimpsed the truth, and they've just uh, they've moved away from it. And she could have, I think, a different version of Naomi Klein could have easily made this movie um, and written the story. Absolutely. Um, it's, and I think, you know, I don't want to, you know, but as soon as you go down this road, you know, I mean, 350.org um, was funded even in its startup phase uh, by Rockefeller uh, Brothers uh, money. And, uh, you know, it's I don't have the figures in front of me, but it's it was a lot of money. I think it's been tens of millions over the years. Um and Naomi has been funded by the Ford Foundation and the, one of the Rockefeller funds as well. And, you know, the question is, uh, you know, we've all struggled for funding. And I, you know, I've uh, struggled for funding, too. And, you know, so but one of the things I learned when I was um, thinking this through as a young man was, um, and I can't remember who's, who, who said this, but we went to this, Michael and I actually went to a talk at... Uh, uh, I think it was the University of, University of Michigan in Flint. And, you know, what the talk was, if you get involved with the system to change it, does the system change or do you change? And the, the, the balance, the speaker's feeling was, it's probably going to be you that changes. And so I think by getting into bed with capitalism and, and renewable energy, you know, um, that's why I think they're so angry about breaking down the fantasy that this, you can't have renewable energy without giant industrial processes that are destructive to the planet, and you can't have it without capitalism. It would be difficult without capitalism, um, without the, these investment schemes, because basically without the subsidies and all the, um, you know, it would be very difficult to have. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just interesting. Um, George Monbiot, who's come after us, uh, you know, just with ridiculous, wild accusation, like, it's just like, wow. I mean, it's obviously, um, it's hit a sore spot, you know, and stuff that isn't, even, that isn't true doesn't even make any sense. But um, I interviewed George Monbiot quite a while ago, and he um, told me uh, one of the greatest f f failings of the environmental movement is the belief you could run a modern society on care, juice, and wishful thinking. And then he went on to tell me about how uh, fossil fuels have brought us this magic. It's like, well, what what happened that people have gotten into these bunkers? You know, it's, it's just I don't know, I don't have an answer to that. Maybe you have a thought, but um, well, Monbiot's the same guy who, after Fukushima, said, as a result of this disaster, I'm no longer neutral on nuclear. I now support it because of climate change. Yeah, and he said yeah, that. So yeah, I was, think he's nuts and he's out of touch with physical reality and he's living in a fantasy land. I can't know any one particular person's psychology, but it, it's I just always felt like in general, like um, it's very difficult, especially the more comfortable life you have or the more you're involved in all these um, systems. I remember seeing some of my um, progressive, you know, simple living, you know, hippie-esque uh, friends that were part of the environmental movement and the activist movement just at this, you know, energy conference dinner with the white tablecloth and the champagne and the, you know, and they brought up like biochar there and they're, oh, here's the next new thing. And I'm like, uh, you know, are we getting sucked into this, you know, machine and seduced with these um, by having a seat at the table um, into, you know, into places we shouldn't go. So, um and I just, you know, I, I grew up on the, the rough side of Flint, the the, uh, the poorest side of town, you know, the place. My joke about it is, yes, I grew up just outside of Flint. We were too poor to live in Flint. Um, you know, in the uh, 90s, that, you know, that was where people, they dragged the bodies from Flint to dump off in the area where I grew up because there was no police department. Um, it was so... I guess I'm, I've never been part of that, and I've, um, you know, remained. Um, I've never had wealth, and I've never been. I was in New York with the, you know, and had a choice to make. I was around all the, what was called green drinks and green networking and solar this and solar that, and um, I just was like, something's not right here, and 
you know, um, eco models and uh, eco fashion and um, sustainable hemp handbags. Um, you know, nothing against hemp, but I'm just saying at the level of clothing and products and shoes and handbags and everything we buy uh, at 8 billion people to try and turn that into hemp. I mean, how many millions of acres of hemp would we have to have? Billions of acres? Right. And as somebody who lives in Oregon where marijuana is legal, I can tell you the level of energy that's used by marijuana grows in this state and the level of fertilizer that many of the growers put on their plants. I mean, it's a it's an industrial production crop for the most part. That's not to say there aren't some people doing it small scale in relatively ecologically friendly ways, but it's an industrial product at this point. Max, I just think you hit on a key thing I, didn't, I wanted to remember is that, you know, we're being distracted by this technology from thinking through what it's going to really be like to live in a way that doesn't destroy the planet. Or I guess at this point, where it begins to destroy the planet less, um, you know, what does that look like to live differently? What, what does it look like to have a different story about who we are as humans, who we are as a culture or cultures? Um, you know, what and how are we going to learn to get along? You know, I've got people with rifles up and down this rural Michigan road who love to shoot them off. Uh, we've got a situation in this state where uh, people are carrying guns into the Capitol to defy the governor's stay-at-home order. Um, you know, we how we experience community and how we take care of each other and whether we learn to get along and, f and figure out some way through some of these impasses, uh, that's going to determine whether we live or die a lot more quickly than whether we have a solar panel or a, or a generator. Um, and, you know, I'm living right now, I'm looking out in this at my yard and it's somebody tried to farm here. Maybe they did. I don't know what they did to it. The soil is like so rock hard. Uh, the, the woods that I, that I can see are, are uh, you know, the ash of all died off the elm. There's dead elm all over the place. The, the, the maple are not reproducing. They're like, they should the cedar, don't look well. I mean, I'm happy to see the woods and I see the goodness in it. But, you know, we've got a huge job. You know, I interviewed, it's not in the film, a couple uh, that grew food for uh, organic food markets, but also, you know, somewhat for themselves. And they're on a similar type of piece of land here in northern Michigan that's been, you know, first the trees were removed and the fire came through and burned the soil. And then the European settlers, you know, um, overdid it in places where they probably shouldn't have been trying to grow crops even. Uh, they said that they've spent their entire lives restoring this piece of land. And so, you know, we're, we're even flipping about what it's going to take to grow food. It's like to restore the soil and, and to figure that out, it's not something you just snap your fingers. Um, so, you know, how are we going to change the great farms of the Midwest into some kind of system uh, that's ecologically sustainable and uh, keeps people alive. Uh, how are we going to have areas that we begin to rewild? Um, you know, these are the questions we should be asking. How are we going to get control of our culture from industrialism and capitalism? Um, and then, so that's, you know, uh, the, these are the, the questions that I can't answer. It's just that we need to begin to answer. And I, do you, maybe, maybe you're seeing that too. It's like that turnaround and it's completely revisioning the system that we're in is, is I think a difficult one because we've been told it's all been figured out. Yeah. And I think we've all been taught growing up that this is the best that it can be. Right. I mean, I think we've all grown up with that mythology that indigenous people essentially had nasty brutish and short lives and we grew up with that sort of racist ideology being taught to us and we grew up learning that you know if not explicitly then at least implicitly that the civilizing of the quote-unquote savages was this wonderful thing and that you know essentially civilization is the greatest thing that's ever happened to the world and it's no surprise that people can't imagine another way to live when literally that education starts from birth, right? That, that idea, you know? And I mean, I think the way I think about it sometimes is people are afraid of, 
people are afraid of and disgusted by the natural world. That is the normal state of education within industrial civilization. That's what people come to. Like the average person, at least if they're light skinned, they are afraid of the sky because it'll give you cancer. The average person is afraid of the water because it will give you giardia and make you sick. The average person is afraid of the dirt because it's dirty and full of who knows what kind of bacteria and so on. The average person is afraid of the plants and the mushrooms because they might be poisonous or whatever. I mean, literally every, these basic fundamental building blocks of life on this planet, we have been taught to, to fear and despise. And the level of separation that has been built between you, you know, us as human beings, as, as creatures who used to live and some of whom, uh, some of us do, do still live in this intimate relationship and connection with the natural world. That connection has been shattered by industrial civilization. And so really, you know, some people talk about human beings within industrial civilization today being a domesticated form of human beings. And just mm-hmm. like, you know, when you domesticate a, a wolf or any other type of creature, you, you know, the, the, the physical characteristics of the animal change, the mental characteristics of the animal change, its behavior changes. And so in a way, we, what we really need to do is undomesticate ourselves. You know, you mentioned rewilding. I think we need to, to rewild ourselves, rewild the land. And to me, the questions that you bring forward are so important. And the answers also seem like, they're challenging in some part because they are so incredibly local, right? Like what's, what a sustainable life looks like is incredibly different in the Mojave Desert versus the Pacific Northwest versus the UP, right? Yeah, the UP. I'm glad you – have you been there? The Upper Peninsula of Michigan? I've got some good friends up there. I haven't made it up there myself, but I've heard it's beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's amazing and – well, there's so much to talk about. I mean, I was thinking about, um, you know, the uh, even what we're doing now. You know, there's a tribe uh, in Wisconsin um, that uh, I had heard had put their trees on a 200-year ro- rotation. Um, you know, and so I hope that would be in the context of some being set aside to, you know, to not be um, cut too. But here in Michigan, um, when I was fighting uh, several biomass plants from coming here, which we won, by the way, or stopped it, at least for now. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll probably try again at some point. But, um, you know, they were, had our, our state forest land, it, it looked like they were doing so much cutting, it was like in a 50-year rotation at best because, you know, 50 years, it's like, you know, and they, that's, that's nothing for a tree. Um, that's nothing f- for a forest. And, um, you know, I was in the UP looking at some ruins um, uh, of all the old, um, the copper mines and the iron mines um, and the smelters that shut down. And some of them as recently as, you know, only a couple decades ago, and they were all already falling in. And I was touring the ruins in Detroit during the uh, Great Recession, and they were all falling apart. And yet there's concrete that's still together from the Roman Empire. Not that the Roman Empire was sustainable because they deforested all the way into Northern Europe, but um, even the things that we, materials we produce, we don't say, let's build a house that'll last 500 years or 1,000 years or build a road. You know, it's it's this constant throughput of um, destruction. And uh, it's, yeah, so it's good, it's good to be aware of it. And what you were saying about being separate from separate from uh, nature, um, do you think there's some kind of trauma? And the reason I'm asking is, uh, when I used to work with abused um, children that were now teenagers, I noticed a lot of them, you know, anything that was like a bug or, you know, I, you almost couldn't go for a walk because any flies or bugs like just almost traumatized them in a way. I, I just, I wonder, hmm, is there some kind of, trauma that we're doing to everyone that kind of, uh, or is it just a slow process? Do you think? It's a good question. One of my good friends, Will Falk is a brilliant writer and poet. And he wrote this essay. He was writing about the pinion juniper forests of the great basin and the intermountain West. And I don't know if you're 
very familiar with the pinion juniper forest, but they have been classified as quote unquote invasive, even though these are native trees to this region, they've been classified as invasive because they're changing their growth patterns. And a lot of researchers and a lot of biologists and actually ecologically minded people will look back and say, okay, these forests were essentially raised to the ground and clear cut to nothing in the 1860s and 1870s when there was a huge uh, gold and silver mining boom throughout this region. And so they needed wood for their smelters. So they basically cut down every tree. There are records of every single tree within a 50 mile radius of many of these mining trees being cut down and there being nothing, not even a stump. So a lot of people will look at these trees regrowing now and say they're just regrowing into areas that they historically used to grow in. But there's a long history now uh, led by the, the cattle industry, no surprise there, to cut down these forests, uh, to bulldoze them over, to drag a chain between two bulldozers and knock down all these trees and then replant it often with non-native grasses that make good forage for the cattle, surprisingly. And so they call this restoration. They say that it's green and it's uh, it's going on right now. And they're destroying old growth forests that people don't think about as old growth forests because the trees never get that big, even though they may be a thousand years old. So anyway, this is all the lead up to Will's writing about this process. And he was writing about how many of the workers who were sent to these remote mining camps in the 1870s were actually refugees from Europe. They were very poor people who were living on the edge, who were coming from families that had nothing, and who were fleeing political persecution, religious persecution, or just plain old poverty in Europe, and came to the U.S. and you know essentially came into a society where they faced uh, you know, they faced racism, they faced discrimination, they faced uh, extreme exploitation of their labor by these capitalist bosses. And then those people went out into the Great Basin and proceeded to cut down the forests that were the main food source for the indigenous people of the region, the Shoshone, Goshut, Paiute, and other nations. And so Will had this incredible insight for me. He talked about refugees creating refugees and to me the more i think about that the more i just look at the last i don't know thousands of years of of civilization that we live within is this process of refugees creating refugees and i think there's an ongoing cycles of trauma that have been going on for thousands of years where you know we're just creating more trauma in each other over and over again and, you know, I think there's also, I have a young nephew and I take him walking in the forest and he's learning to identify trees. He loves birds. You know, he's just three years old and it's incredible to just see a child uh, have this fundamental affinity for the natural world, right? I think we're all sort of born naturalists because our ancestors needed to be able to identify native plants and wildlife and needed to understand patterns of seasonality and weather and uh, microclimates and water availability and all of these things, right, that our ancestors needed to survive on a daily basis. We, we all have this in, intrinsic uh, ability within us to connect on, an, on a level that's incredibly deep, that's incredibly nuanced. Uh, because right. that well, relationship is how you survive, mm-hmm. right? And that's that's been that's been broken. And I think that's a process that is inherently traumatic. The process of schooling, the process of forcing kids to stay inside the process, you know, all these things that we all go through as kids. Yeah. One of the things I, um, um, remember from my work with, um, you know, troubled, um, you know, teenagers and young adults was, um, um, you know, especially the teenagers noticing that a lot of them were obsessed with, um, you know, this, um, you know, this kind of really dark things, but I was just thinking about what they absorbed and what, you know, uh, in their upbringing, um, that 
stories used to be, you know, both indigenous peoples, but even, you know, European stories were always set, uh, you know, in nature. And they, they were, um, you know, whether it was, you know, Peter Rabbit or, you know, whatever it was, you know, the stories. Um, but now the stories have become, you know, transformers in these machines and these magic powers. And, um, and I thought, well, what does that mean that we're switching these, especially for boys, these stories to these machines, you know? Um, and I think that's, you know, there was no science fiction, which I loved as a kid, um, you know, before there were fossil fuels. I mean, there was very early on, there was Frankenstein, uh, just the earliest glimpse of uh, this kind of industrial civilization. And then there was H.G. Wells and uh, um, yeah, and the early science fiction of the late, you know, uh, 1800s and early 1900s. But um, I really feel like it's such an issue of psychology, sociology, and stories because it's not just this generation who's been impacted, but I, 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 I would ballpark for seven generations now. Um, this, like, ever-expanding uh, civilization that brings us ever more uh, goodies um, you know, has really changed our not only our culture, but our individual psychology. So that now we expect the stuff brought to us from, from industrial civilization uh, we expect that it will just continue, and I think that's part of why uh, we just have to believe in the story of green energy. There has to be this magic thing, because for seven generations, we've expected the next thing that's going to bail us out, uh, the next thing that's going to provide, you know, it wasn't that long ago, none of us had a smartphone. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, none of us e no, but even had an individual phone. Um, it wasn't that long ago where... Uh, I rare I didn't know anybody that flew when I was in high school, I and I maybe heard of one person when I was in college, uh, and now you know and then flash forward I have a job where, you know before I stopped flying you know I'm I'm living with a laptop right in a, a little bag and I'm ready to fly to L.A. for a meeting, you know so this more and more and more the story of more I think um, underwritten unfortunately. Not saying I'm a fan of fossil fuels, but just describing the situation, underwritten by these mountains and oceans of fossil fuels, has convinced us that this is going to go on forever, and not just in our mm -hmm. rational minds, but in our whole fiber. And that's part of the reason you're seeing this big kerfuffle, is that's a big shock to recognize that this this is going to come to an end one way or the other. If we if we have a planned ending. I think that will go a lot better uh, than like this virus coming and, and kicking us in the behind and shaking us up and causing death and suffering. Um, and that's really uh, one of the reasons I made this movie. I think there's a fall coming um, that will be, um, it's hard for us to even get our heads around. And it's a fall for humans and our non-human brothers and sisters as well. Um, and I don't even want to get into that now, but if you see the chart I put in the middle of the movie, that that chart which actually describes the rise in all things human is is the most frightening thing I've ever seen. And it's amazing to me that there's not more writing and discussion about, even from a um, system standpoint, how that can be sustained. It's and what I didn't put in the movie, which I wanted to, was a was a the flip side of that rise into all things human, um, especially our phenomenal levels of consumption among those of us who are able to, is a commensurate decline in everything in the, in the natural world. Um, you know, you've seen the statistic where 96% of mammals by weight are now humans, farm animals, or pets. You know, half the plants that existed uh, before civilization got going by biomass are, are said to be gone. 70% of the trees on this planet have been cut at least once. 90% um, of the fish in the ocean are said to be gone. Um, and solving climate change will not change any of that. Um, even there's a 2017 study in the journal Nature um, 
that d detailed 8,000 critically endangered species. And the, what were the top threats? It was the expansion of agriculture and logging, including tree plantations, which are basically a dead zone. Um, so deforestation and agriculture, uh, hunting and fishing, poaching. You know, these giant trawlers that take fish from the ocean um, and uh, the built world. You know, all these roads, every time I, you know, when I went and built my house in the woods, I was like, oh, well, what does that matter? Well, over and over again, I abandoned w where I grew up in Flint to go build a house in the middle of nowhere. You know, so, um, and then invasive species and climate change, mining, you know, but climate change is one factor, but the top two are, are the direct destruction of nature through um, agriculture and deforestation and the direct killing of animals, um, you know, and, and, and so why doesn't that story get told? And even there was a UN report, and the UN tries really hard to make climate the lead thing. And again, climate is disastrous, and the, we are in a climate emergency. But even last year's UN report listed those two things, the, 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 you know, decimating habitat, basically, and killing living creatures as the top two things, and climate change as an increasing factor. So you yeah. tell me why is the environmental movement, everything gets tied into climate change. I even heard people during the Amazon fires last summer, which were directly caused by greed, and ex ex trying to expand logging, cattle ranches, biofuels, uh, you know, food production. Um, I heard people stumbling, like, in news reports, like, because some part of their brain wanted to say, but, but you know, we need to take action on climate change because of the Amazon. It's, it's like, um, do you understand what I'm getting at? It's like we've been programmed to just think in this, this very narrow way. And I believe because it lends itself to capitalism selling us these giant pieces of technology. I think that's part of it. And the other piece that I would add, I don't know if you agree with this, so I'm curious, is I would say the focus is there because global warming represents an existential threat to industrial civilization and, and the collapse of biodiversity, dead zones in the ocean, soil erosion, habitat destruction, these things, as long as industrial civilization can keep expanding its energy sources, if they do figure out fusion, God forbid, you know, that type of thing, I think industrial civilization could potentially, you know, I don't know for sure, obviously it's just a guess, an educated guess, but could potentially overcome those ecological uh, collapses. But climate change, I think, represents more of an existential threat to industrial civilization as a whole. And so I think, I think you're absolutely right. It, it's profitable. It can be it can be exploited to create profit and and gigantic. I mean, we're talking trillions of dollars, right? Which you cover in the film, new markets, and and I think there's that second piece of it that global warming is more of a threat to industrial civilization. And so I, I think it really exposes how many people in the climate movement, frankly, aren't really that interested in nature at all. And they're just focused on human right. well-being, which, you know, human well-being is important. I'm not a misanthrope. Like, I, I love my friends and family. I have great relationships with the people around me. I, I like people in general. You know, I, I'm not a misanthrope who wants oh, to yeah. kill everybody. That's but why I, I spent 20, 20 years as a social worker, you know, because I really care about people. And right. my fear is that by not attending to these things, we are, you know, I don't even, I, I, I don't see, um, you know, we're dooming people to a miserable fate by being in the wrong story. And, uh, and I don't want that to happen uh, to anyone. Uh, and it's already happening. But you, th I think the way I would parse that is uh, you raise a good question. I don't have a full answer to it, except ecology used to be about, uh, you know, ecosystems and the fact that we need to keep, we're part of nature and we need to keep nature alive and thriving and happy uh, to even exist ourselves. Uh, and it slowly got turned into environmentalism, 
environmentalism, which became about more about us. And we should care about us, but I think climate change, you know, we're so built, you know, if humans were not plastered along all of the, uh, the ocean front around the world and all the waterfront, uh, the, you know, the seas would rise and habitats would change. It's not perhaps a, a good thing at all that's happening so quickly, but it's really the thing that's impacting us directly. You know, where I live in, in Michigan here, um, there's very little habitat for the last remaining piping plovers. Uh, it's been reduced to little islands. So now with the rising Great Lakes, um, where's there left for them to go? So if we didn't have control of all the shoreline, um, so many, you know, 99% of the shoreline, um, the habitat would change and that they, they would probably be able to adjust. Um, we've removed all the uh, piping plovers, need firewood, uh, not firewood, um, but driftwood to shelter under. And everywhere they're trying to survive, you know, and I've done this too without thinking, we go down to the beach and we grab up all the driftwood and we have a nice fire. Um, so um, climate change is the thing that's going to impact human civilization uh, directly. We've And why don't we think the other things are affecting us? Because we're using vast quantities of fossil fuels to overcome them. So uh, let's say that we didn't weren't able to raise fish and fish farms um, using fossil fuel-based systems. Um, we'd be very upset about the, the oceans being uh, devoid of fish. Yeah, and if uh, let's say we couldn't raise food Alaska, in these in, there. if we couldn't raise meat and food in these industrial farms we'd be very upset about the the forest not being productive and the land not being productive um so it's yeah I, it's it's a, we're, at, we're now we're talking about the right territory which is um what kind of systems I don't think we've. I don't think anybody's come to grips with what kind of systems are going to sustain us uh, with less fossil fuels. And I think it's like time to start. Uh, way past time to start figuring that out. Absolutely, yeah. And that's work that a lot of people, you know, are are doing around the world. You know, different elements of it, but the culture as a whole is not grappled with it at all, right? So I want to. I want to try and start bringing this to a conclusion here. Um, I know it's impossible to cover everything in this interview. You know, we, um, I, I wanted to touch base with you on some population issues, which I thought you had some great follow-up points on your website that added to the discussion of that in the film. And, uh, I wanted to dive into nuclear a little more. We covered that in a bit of detail, but, um, it's impossible to cover all these topics in one interview just like it's impossible to cover everything in one film right so the final question that i want to ask you jeff is about what people can do and sort of from the practical side so you know we're living in these very dire times and i think there are a lot of people who want to figure out how to make the world a better place but they don't know where to start, right? So you've been involved in people's movements, in resistance work and grassroots movements for a long time. What skills or organizing structures should people who are listening to this work to build in themselves and in their community to face up to these hard questions? Um, I still think we're on a learning curve. I think we all want to feel like we understand the mess we're in, and I don't think we do. And I think um, having had the uh, privilege of reading uh, your book um, that's going to be coming out, um, you know, that we need more, um, you know, you, nobody has ever put, you know, Ozzy Zenner did a great job with uh, Green Illusions. And you've, I think, taken the ball and run with it in terms of really diving into the details of all the fantasies about technology. I think we still need to do more educating ourselves. Uh, and that might sound like a cop-out, but, um, you know, one film can't do it. We need to educate ourselves about who we are as humans, all, you know, the full mess we're in, you know, um, and really come to grips with the fact that growth 
has to be over. And if we don't end growth, nature's going to end it for us. Um, you know, when we have a partial solution, so some of my favorite things to think about are how to not have a lawn. I mean, that would be 40 million acres in the U.S. right now, but uh, not having a lawn is not going to do shit unless we get together and stop fighting the fuck, you know, unless we get together and stop fighting the freaking development that's happening you know, all around us. You know, I live in a place, community that's addicted to growth, doubling the airport. You know, the population here in the area with, you know, second homes and summer homes and it just went through the ceiling. Um, we're all we're on this story of growth wherever we're at. And, you know, we've got to challenge that story, learn more about it. So, so you know, planting trees is another thing that comes up. Uh, first of all, there's not enough time to plant enough trees. Yes, plant trees. You know, I'd like to, I planted some trees in the yard here, but we've lost our fight. We got to stop the deforestation. We got to, and it doesn't just mean in the tropics. It means around where we're at. This, this, you know, if you go to, to rural areas and you see the logging, it's just, it's, it's just, it's still going on. Um, and, you know, we're clearing every time we clear a forest or a wooded lot. Um, that's also a law, a law. So, you know, we have to rethink what we're doing as environmentalists. And I think, so we, we need to learn more about the big picture and, um, and, and keep on that learning path. But locally, um, you know, I'd like to see us get back to, uh, you know, there was, uh, it, it became legal to shoot coyotes basically whenever the, the heck you wanted in Michigan. And I had some friends that went to the hearing and they were like, they were the only environmentalists there at, at the, the state hearing they went to. Maybe there was some other environment, some environmental group with a couple people. Um, we we're losing all these battles. Um, you know, and I, but I think that's where the action is at. Um, in terms of right now is every piece of habitat you can defend every, uh, development. Um, we can, you know, um, ask whether we need that or not. You know, there was a, uh, a dune, uh, the forested dune, uh, near this doctor's office I used to go to. And one day I pulled up and they were just bulldozing the whole dune down. I'm like, we have more environmentalists here per square foot than almost anywhere in the country. And yet just here they are, cut down the trees, bulldoze down that dune and, uh, put in some houses. Um, and then we wonder why there's no butterflies or honeybees left um, cut by cut. So um, I think local activism is where it's at, but we've got to re, uh, keep educating ourselves and figure out a way to get uh, a new environmental movement. Maybe it's going to be called something else. So um, I will be coming up with my list of things to do, but they all have to be in the context of, you know, if, if we built a rail system that lasted, you know, a thousand years, um, but that wasn't part of a plan for degrowth, uh, we'd still be screwed. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's think about that rail system, but let's think about the larger context of what it would be all like, what it would be like to share more and uh, take care of each other and have a simpler life uh, where we were all happier. With nature, you know, uh, having rebounded all around us, um, And so much of the world wants to grow back. I certainly have seen what you're talking about in my neighborhood. You know, I live in a beautiful rural neighborhood. I don't own, quote unquote, own land, but I, I rent land out here. And just in this neighborhood, you know, there's new houses going in, people putting in gravel lots, people cutting the forest, you know, in these it's just a, a one little bit at a time, and people like to think about the destruction of the planet in terms of the Amazon rainforest or those palm oil plantations down in Indonesia, but people don't like to think about what's happening right in their very own backyard, even when it comes down to uh, there are some yellow jackets that I don't like, so I'm going to I'm going to kill them, and yeah, people don't realize that's yeah. a yeah that's an important native insect actually, and you know, they may be kind of annoying to you, but if you can't take a little bit of annoyance in order to take a small step to protect biodiversity on this planet and fight against the insect collapse, then, you know, then maybe you need to reassess your priorities. 
Yeah, I just there was one dandelion that sprouted. It's been a very late cold spring here, and uh, I got my first dandelion, and I went and uh, looked at it, and there's like uh, four or five, you know, uh, tiny bees on that one dandelion. And I'm like, okay, you know, that's that's a good thing, and and if if we let nature, nature will recover, and if we let humans that understand how to live with nature um, lead the way, um, we'll be a lot better off. Uh, I just want to be clear. I've been one of one of the, those people too. I mean, we all are participating, and uh, um, you know, there's used to be saying, um, "Think global, live, you know, live local." And uh, I think we have to work on both levels. But you know, I've been part of this story too. Uh, if there would, you know, um, instead of abandoning Flint, if there was a way that uh, culturally and personally we would have stayed there and uh, um, not let all those houses go downhill and you know instead i wanted to do what was good for me and imagine i was uh, some green man amidst the woods not realizing here i uh the woods didn't want me to come chop down the trees and bulldoze a driveway and cut more trees for my cabin uh that uh and, you know and get cement from somewhere for my basement and copper wiring that already existed in flint and you know and then, then it fell apart so um, it's a story of, of, um, you know, the stories we tell ourselves are the most important things. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for being on the program today. Thanks, Max. And, uh, great to talk to you. You have been listening to The Green Flame, a Deep Green Resistance podcast. You can find us online at dgrnewsservice.org. You can also find us on iTunes, Google Play, and wherever else you listen to your podcast. Please rate the show and leave us a review. Thank you for listening, and until next time.
Oh, <laughs> 